been talking about this interview with Dominique Mochianu now for this uh, first hour, and I tweeted about it multiple times on Monday evening after I spoke to her. You know the name because it's a household name. She was one of the Magnificent Seven, uh, a USA Gymnastics legend from 1996, part of the team all-around gold medal. Uh, She was just 14 years old at the time, the youngest ever. Uh, A pixie, cute but strong and powerful and athletic and won our hearts as part of that crew in Atlanta on on our own soil in the Summer Olympics. That's just one piece of her story. It's the public part. It's not necessarily what she wants to be remembered for. And in light of the accusations that have come out about former team doctor Larry Nasser and the charges have now moved to criminal charges from dozens of young women, both in USA Gymnastics as well as athletes at Michigan State, which was where he had a clinic and where he treated athletes. Uh, In light of those sex abuse charges, Dominique is speaking out yet again about USA Gymnastics and about some of the other gymnasts that she worked and trained with. This story is getting national attention Uh, because of a 60 Minutes piece that was done with former USA gymnasts Jessica Howard, Jeanette Antolin, and Jamie Dancher, who won a a bronze medal at the 2000 Olympics. And here's just a piece of their interview on 60 Minutes uh, with about Dr. Nasser, but with 60 Minutes. remember thinking something was off, but I didn't feel like I was able to say anything because he was, you know, this very high-profile doctor, and I was very lucky to be at the ranch working with him. Did any of the other girls in your cabin talk to you about Dr. Nasser? Yes. The girls would say, yeah, he touches you funny. I remember being uncomfortable because of the area, but in my mind, I was like, if this helps, I'll do anything. Did you ever complain to anybody about it? No. Why not? It was treatment. You don't complain about treatment. Again, the voices of Jessica and Jeanette and Jamie as they were three to sit down with 60 Minutes. It's After Hours with Amy Lawrence here on CBS Sports Radio. And I had a chance to talk with Dominique on Monday evening. And I started out by asking her when she heard Jamie's interview and Jeanette and Jessica on 60 Minutes. When the story finally got national attention, what was her reaction? Well, I knew about the NASA story a year ago. Jamie and Jessica had contacted me. So I really helped get the ball rolling with them. They trusted me and told me their story. And I and I told them that I couldn't sit back and, and let them not report it now that I knew what had happened to them. And, of course, you know, all of those feelings of nervousness and um, fear of backlash and fear of coming forward – um, all played into, you know, into the timeline. But once we got over that and we discussed kind of things to to move forward, um, I just strongly encouraged them to stay strong. And, one, you know, step by step, they were able to get to the place where they felt comfortable to come forward. So I'm really, really proud of how brave they've been. And then Jeanette was really close with Jamie and then brought her up on board as well because she realized, oh, my goodness, I received this treatment as well. So the long and short of it is they came forward together because they were going to be stronger together. And um, they really felt that this was going to help make a change as well. And I've been speaking of abuse in our sport since 2008, and certainly I was dis- dismissed essentially by USA Gymnastics' Steve Penny, who's the president. But it's been really um, a long journey, but I really feel that we're going to make some positive changes right now, and I'm just really proud of them. Obviously, with the NASCAR situation, it's um, it shocked a lot of the community because he was so trusted almost too trusted obviously now we know he was definitely too trusted but he just had free reign to go to whoever's room he wanted to whenever everybody trusted him blindly and so many people didn't speak up when certain procedures were happening because people believed well wait a second is this actual treatment I think they were confused they were little and they were teenagers some of them were younger than teenagers and they don't know what to say. 
when you're having an intravaginal procedure and you're not at an OBGYN, I mean, you're kind of stunned and shocked. And I was never sexually assaulted by Dr. Nassar, but I know of so many stories now from the women and all the things that I've read and the women that I've talked to that have come forward, and they're all just so eerily the same and familiar in the sense that the stories all start out the same. And these, this was a predator in our community. And the fact that he nearly had free roam for almost 30 years um, is, is awfully scary. Let's go back to that conversation that you had with these gymnasts who've since come forward and done the interview on 60 Minutes. And as you say, you know them personally. You worked alongside them. What was that like for you, considering your history with USA Gymnastics? What were the emotions and the feelings from those phone calls and those conversations with these young women who've who've now come forward? Well, initially, I just I wanted to wring Larry's neck. I mean, I just couldn't believe that he would take such advantage of these women. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you can't be the only one. He, he had to have done it to more people. And, of course, my initial you know, thoughts were to comfort you know, the women that came to me and offer them support and offer them guidance and love and say, you know, this was wrong, to have them really acknowledge that it was wrong. Because they're like, oh, yeah, this happened to me. And I'm like, no, that's not okay. And I'm like, that is absolutely not okay. That's, that's breaking the law. Like, that is violating you and, and absolutely not okay. So you, you really should strongly consider reporting it. And it's my obligation to tell you that. Um, and I just kept reiterating to them that they, they're going to do the right thing and they're going to be safe and that they will be okay um, because those moments are very scary. And I believed them right away because these women would not make these things up. I mean, I know these women. I trained with um, some of them. And Jessica, I've known for a long time through different avenues in the sport, and I've always known her to be very, very trusting And just such a sweetheart. And it broke my heart that some of her innocence was taken away. And when she told me, I just, I was so disappointed and disgusted with Nassar that he would do this to our most vulnerable in our sport. Because gymnasts, they're oftentimes very sheltered. They live a life that's dedicated to the sport. And they're oftentimes not always their age in the sense that they socially sometimes are a couple of years behind just because they spend their life growing up in a gym and they're sheltered and they haven't experienced some, some other real life experiences, but they've had a lot of really interesting, highly athletic experiences that cause them to be under a lot of stress and pressure and they can handle those situations so well. But when it came to some of these other inappropriate acts, because he was so accepting and, and so, Um, trusted in the community, people didn't really question him. There were even people honestly coming to their, coming to Nassar's defense. And now we know, of course, that dozens and dozens of young women, both in USA Gymnastics as well as athletes from Michigan State, have accused Nassar of doing the same things. We're spending a few minutes with Dominique Mochianu, who was a gold medalist with Team USA in 1996 and is now trying to shed some light on what she talks about uh, in her autobiography, uh, extended emotional and physical abuse of a lot of young gymnasts who come through the program. It's After Hours with Amy Lawrence on CBS Sports Radio. So you wrote this book in 2012, and now we're hearing more and more from other young women who've gone through the program. And the word that keeps coming up, Dominique, is culture. The culture of USA Gymnastics that allowed these types of things to go on for an extended period of time. So from your perspective, both in the program as an athlete and then later working with USA Gymnastics, how would you describe the culture, the culture of USA Gymnastics? Well, there was a culture at the national team training camps of fear and abuse and and just the fear of ever stepping forward because if you step forward, you get ostracized or you say something that they don't like, they all of a sudden will take away the dangling carrot. And the dangling carrot is your Olympic dream. And they would take it out on you 
or if a coach were to speak up for you, they would take it out on their athlete in the future. They wouldn't put them on a world or Olympic team. So they used that threat, and they didn't always have to verbalize it. But it was the, the fear inside the culture of the gym and the training and the training sessions. I mean, they basically hold your dream in their hands. They select the Olympic team. The National you know, Team Training Center has a selection committee. Marta Caroli, you know, had a huge hand in selecting the Olympic team since we started the semi-centralized you know, training system back in 2000. And so a lot of the, they were my personal coaches. So I didn't only have to see them every month. I saw them every day. And from my personal experience, I was one of the few athletes that this ever happened to. Uh, and I don't believe it happened to many, but especially American gymnasts. In Romania, it happened more, but my, they used to threaten me, like Bella and Marta Caroli would threaten me with, I'm going to call your father so he can enforce basically physical punishment on you if you gained weight or if you appear to gain weight. And that mental stress when I was, you know, 11, 12, 13, I was, I was four foot four. I was 70 pounds. I mean, I was very, very little. I never, didn't have a weight problem. But they always made it seem like if I had a bad practice, it was because I was fat. It was always back to that. And so that psychological trauma on a daily basis that was not healthy for us. And everyone got that in 2000 where, you know, it was always about their weight or this culture that was constantly, you know, trying to shame you um, if you did a poor performance. I mean, they were brutal. They wouldn't even look at you and they would just disown you. Um, and, of course, that happened with many co coaches. It infiltrated into the elite women's program because so many coaches just thought it was acceptable behavior and none of the gymnasts could really speak up and say, no, this is not okay. We didn't have protection. We didn't have somebody looking out for us to say, this is wrong. But I started to realize it was wrong after I left the sport. And I knew it when I was going through it, but I was too young to process why I felt the way I did. Why did I hurt so much? Why did I cry myself to sleep on some nights? Why, why did that happen? It was because of the cruel treatment. It was because of constant that threat in the gym and the fear that everybody was always scared to say something. And if you did, you, you were ostracized. You were the bad person. So not only are you going through all of this you know, psychological back and forth and, and abusive environment that made you always seem like, you know, I better not do anything wrong, even to the point where we're training on injuries time and time again, so I, once I collapsed in the gym, and that was because I was afraid to say I was hurting because they would make it appear, now this is the Crowley, they were my personal coaches, but they would make it appear like it was, it was made up in my mind. So they played these manipulative mind games, and it infiltrated into the whole women's elite program, and the Crowley's brought that over, that system over 30 plus years ago when they came to the United States, they brought a lot of that over. And they mess with your head that way. And so that's the culture of fear we're talking about. Anybody that speaks up is ostracized. And you, there wasn't any protection, even though there are policies that say, oh, you know, they are protected. Well, how come everybody is silent in the community except a few of us? I mean, you really can't find a lot of big names in our sport talking about this. And that's why. When you published your autobiography called Off Balance, as you've done these interviews and you've spoken about your own experience, as well as encouraged the young women to come forward in these sexual abuse claims, what happened? What happened when you went public? Well, I was ostracized from Steve Penny and USA Gymnastics. Some people are good people there. I can't say everybody there was you know, not nice, but Steve Penny was at the helm of mistreatment. I not only had gone through all these things and I needed to heal and I wrote my book so I could heal, but also help others and, and let them know that, you know, you too can heal. I saw too many, far too many brokenhearted gymnasts leave the sport in bits and pieces and nobody cared about them. Whether you made it to the Olympics or not, you know, a person is a person. And they all had psychological, you know, trauma after they left the sport and they became depressed. And I saw all these brokenhearted gymnasts and I was brokenhearted, too, because, you know, my coach abandoned me at the Olympics and made me feel worthless, even though I had won a gold medal. 
So for me, writing my book was a lot about healing and really trying to heal those wounds that were so deep and so scarred. And it really helped me come come out of my shell and say, I can do this, I'm strong enough to do this, and I'm going to help other people along the way. But I didn't have immediate public support. I got a lot of private support. A lot of people behind the scenes were like, oh, my gosh, you are so right, so proud of you. And then yet it, when it came to public support, it was crickets because everybody was so scared that if they came forward, they would get mistreated like I did when I came forward. I was ostracized by USAG. I was dismissed. Not only did they add kind of salt to the wound, but they gave my coaches, the ones that I talked about, doing these behaviors, they gave them a promotion, and they left me in the dust and were basically trying to depict me as someone who was bitter, as someone who didn't deserve to be treated nicely, and and tried to poison the minds of the other athletes in the elite women's program to kind of stay away from me, and I was like a leper. I was somebody that they should stay away from because I was a bad person for speaking against my coaches in the way that I did. And all I did was speak the truth, but that was the backlash. It was constant. I was an enemy to them, and and that was not my intention at all. And I should never have been mistreated for the last 10 years. I've been mistreated by USA Gymnastics, Steve Penny, since I've come forward. And I continually get mistreated. You can sense the unwelcome vibe when I go to gymnastics competition. You can sense that. It's, it's just a feeling, and it's the way that they act around you. It, it's really petty and immature. But that's what happens. And a lot of these women, Jessica and Jamie, they saw how I was treated. And a part of the reason they did not want to come forward is because of how I was treated. That was a big part of what made them scared. They didn't want to be treated that way nobody wants to but I told them if they came forward I would back them up and I would stick by their side and I would not let them do it alone this is after hours with Amy Lawrence had a chance to spend about a half an hour on the phone with magnificent seven member Dominique Mochianu who was part of that gold medal winning squad in Atlanta in 1996 (laughs) four foot four and all of 70 pounds and she has talked about her own emotional and psychological and physical abuse at the hands of her coaches, the Carolis. They were her personal coaches. And she's also supported the young women who've come forward, some of whom she knows personally, and said she knew about the claims of sexual abuse for a year and encouraged these gymnasts to speak up and to file these lawsuits. And the second part of my conversation, I started out by asking her, about USA Gymnastics, about the culture. And I read her a quote from Jamie Dancher, who said to 60 Minutes about USA Gymnastics, they've been covering it up for years. They've been covering it up for years is exactly what Jamie said in that interview on CBS. So I asked Dominique, do you think that the people who worked inside USA Gymnastics were capable of covering all of this up, including the criminal activities? Well, absolutely. I mean, I've seen a whole trail of evidence that the Indy Star has done with their investigative reporting. If you look at what they've recently posted on Friday, there was um, 5,600 documents, I believe, from how USA Gymnastics handled child um, sexual abuse cases. And it was all of the depositions that they were going through. And there were quotes from Steve Penny talking about you know, the coach is just as much a member of the gymnastics, you know, membership as the athlete, but they never gave the athlete the benefit of the doubt. They allowed sexual convicted criminals to not be banned from USA Gymnastics membership. They Even the police found these people guilty, and they still hadn't banned them from the sport, and then they went back into the sport, into the gym clubs, and the gym clubs didn't know, and they went on to be predators and molest other children. I mean, that's pretty severe, and that's alleged negligence at the highest levels. I mean, you're talking about some serious, serious flaws in the system. If you are letting convicted criminals back in and you're not notifying the community and membership and banning that person, what more evidence do you need if the police has convicted this person? They were saying they needed more investigation. Well, no, you don't. 
if someone had inappropriate touching toward a child and displayed these behaviors, they put one coach on probation. And then he went on, he violated the probation, molested other children, and then and they still hadn't banned him. And eventually they banned him. But, I mean, those are the types of problems that you run into when you don't have a serious policy on handling abuse and sexual abuse cases. There's a trail of all of this being brushed on the rug. And I know friends of mine that have talked to CPenny till they were blue in the face, wrote emails, tried to get people banned because they were predators. And it was almost as if it was a nuisance for Steve Penny, who's the president of USA Gymnastics. So he absolutely has no position to be in his authority and leadership anymore. I mean, there's enough there for the board of directors to say, we cannot allow this anymore, and someone has to be held accountable for all these children that were harmed. Before I let you go, Dominique, uh, you've talked a little bit about some changes that you feel need to be made at the top of USA Gymnastics. But I know that you've become very passionate about reforms and changes within the sport itself. So as you look at what's happened, your own experiences and those of former teammates, other gymnasts that have now come forward, what needs to happen? What needs to happen to protect? Because that's the word I keep hearing. What needs to happen to protect other young women and girls uh, from this type of thing ever taking place again right well there are people working on this really right now as we speak and one thing that we can all do as a community is be vigilant we absolutely have to also make everybody an extension of what teachers and doctors are mandatory reporters within our olympic sports and all youth sports because we need to if we see something say something and we need young children to know and be educated on this is not okay. Good touch, bad touch. We need education to our community to have uh, sexual abuse survivors and also people like safer athletes who do really a great job as being a third-party watchdog to help with reporting and anonymous reporting, but also educating the parents, the, the coaches, the athletes on what is appropriate behavior in the gym and what is not so that everybody is on high alert and they understand the rules. Um, Another thing to do for anybody who has a coach is to never, for the parents to never let the child be alone with a coach. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. I know that maybe during a private lesson, a, a, you know, parent may want to just go grab some coffee. Absolutely not. Do not leave your child in a vulnerable position. You should always have the three person rule, two adults and one child. If there's private lesson going on in the gym club, there should be no reason at all and the coach should want this as well and if they don't you should be suspicious because that protects the coach and it protects the athlete you should always have a parent and two adults the coach is one adult and then the parent is the second one the three-person rule where there's always an eyewitness to your children and watching your children should never let them go by themselves in the car with the coach and all of these things will help eliminate a lot of these times where predators can can get your children alone. And that will be a start. That's a great starting point. But the mandatory reporting is something that we're working on in our community and hopefully through legislation. But um, there's just, you can never be too vigilant and too aware. And I think, you know, educating our community on um, these protocols and how to be safe is also a step in the right direction. Knowing everything that you know now, the lowest of the lows that you talk about in your book, your own experiences, but the highest of the highs, the gold medal, the Magnificent Seven being a household name, would you do it again? Was it worth it to you to go through all of this? You know, I, I'm looking at my career and I'm proud that I was able to overcome so much. I look at my career and my gold medal as a collection of hard work And the fact that I didn't let them break me. I fought really, really hard for this dream. I'm proud of all that I've accomplished. And I will not let them take away my joy anymore for the sport. For so long, I felt ashamed that I wasn't good enough. And maybe I could have done better even after winning the gold. And I allowed those people who harmed me and mistreated me to let me feel so bad about myself. Even when I had reached the pinnacle and had all the success in my sport. So I 
always want to look back and say, I survived and I made it through and I'm helping others and it's okay that I went through it. Um, I may not have gone through it the same way if I had another option to go through it again, but I did it and I lived through it and I'm helping other people now through those experiences. And of course I would do it again because I, I had the Olympic dream. I would change a few things if I had the option, but I feel like it forced me to grow and it made me part of who I am today. Part of why I'm passionate about this subject and this topic is because those things that I experienced. And I certainly want to put the bad people away in our sport that harms so many of our youth. So I obviously cannot change the past and I cannot change what happened, but I can change the future and I can change my perspective and my attitude on how I look at my career. And I'm certainly proud of it. I don't ever want to let those people who harm me take away my joy and take away the hard work that I put into this sport because they tried to shame me or ostracize me or mistreat me for coming forward with the truth. Um, I will never give them that joy ever again. Well, I admire you so much for not only speaking about your own story and your own experience, but also encouraging other young women to come forward and to be strong and sharing their stories as well as as hard as it is. You can follow Dominique on Twitter at D Of course, a member of the Magnificent Seven uh, who won a gold medal in Atlanta and captured our hearts, but now uh, feels as though she's got a bigger purpose and a greater challenge in front of her. Dominique, thank you so much for your honesty and for a couple of minutes on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me and uh, best of luck.